Thank you, Amelia. So that was excellent. And uh, for everybody uh, still here, uh, which is a lot of you, we are nearing the end of our workshop. And uh, the next two sessions are examples of interprofessional efforts that are underway to respond to uh, COVID and the COVID crisis. We believe they demonstrate rapid cycle learning and a system-based thinking approach responding to this pandemic and to the needs of our patients. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Robert Kane, President and CEO of the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine, or ACOM, and the individual spearheading uh, a project called Students Assist America. Dr. Kane. Thank you, Dr. D'Agostino. We deeply appreciate the opportunity to share information about our interprofessional public health initiative, Students Assist America, with those attending today. Next slide, please. The story of Students Assist America really begins on March 15th of this year. The deans of our colleges of osteopathic medicine were faced with the challenge of how to continue education for their students in the face of the unfolding pandemic. A particular concern was the ability to continue clinical education in the absence of adequate personal protective equipment and a disrupted learning environment. We also recognize the importance of identifying ways that students could meaningfully be part of the pandemic response with consideration to proper credit when possible. While medical students may not typically be thought of as an essential part of the healthcare workforce, we were of the opinion that they would be an important part of the pandemic response because of the unique knowledge and skills they acquire during their medical education. Next slide. We recognize that COVID-19 is a complex adaptive systems problem. Interconnectedness and interrelationships are a prominent feature of such a problem. These features are also a prominent part of osteopathic philosophy. So we decided to apply the same principles to our organizational response that we would apply to patient care. The first foundational principle of osteopathic philosophy emphasizes the interconnectedness of body, mind, and spirit, and the need to address them together when caring for each patient. We decided it was important to focus on more than just the public health issues directly arising from viral infection, considering the likely impact upon community health and mental health as well. This approach made us quickly realize the importance of working together with other health professions. Next slide. Consistent with the body, mind, spirit approach, we invited others to talk about their responses to the pandemic and to participate. First to the table were the schools of public health, social work, and psychology. This quickly expanded as we shared the vision for an interprofessional public health initiative to com combat the pandemic with others. Today, 11 organizations are part of the Students Assist America effort. Importantly, many of them are represented by their CEOs. Next slide. Initial conversations focused on ways for us to share best practices across professions develop shared content for educating students about COVID-19 and developing a common curriculum that might be utilized in clinical settings. We were concerned about the impact the pandemic was having or would have upon students. Faced with uncertainty, we knew it was important to provide students with a sense of purpose, helping them to have some sense of control when things seem otherwise out of control. Student safety, success, and security, or peace of mind, were key features of our conversations. Next slide. When this conversation began on March 15th, we were only thinking about 14,000 osteopathic medical students potentially contributing to the pandemic response. The question asked was, how could they help? With 11 organizations in place, the question became, what can we do with 1 million extra sets of hands? We spent significant time identifying potential tasks that would fit the knowledge base and skill set of students across the involved professions. Because of the absence of PPE, our focus was upon no contact or low risk roles as identified by the, by the outer two rings of this diagram. As PPE should become available, 
we would consider additional roles towards the center where risk might be higher. Our first thoughts included the idea of interprofessional student teams undertaking contact tracing, educating patients by phone, completing well elderly checks, and doing mental health screenings. We were looking for opportunities for these students to learn from each other and to work together. Next slide. There were many complexities and challenge associated with these ideas. We ultimately looked for the one or two things, mental health needs included, that the members of the collaboration could focus their efforts upon that might involve the greatest number of students across the professions. We decided it was important to first expand the vaccination workforce. We understood that our country was about to undertake the largest mass vaccination effort ever. Extra hands are going to be needed. Next slide. Expanding the vaccination workforce meant working with the existing conditions. We identified three steps to move forward. Working with the governor of each state to address liability concerns and to facilitate creation of necessary institutional agreements. Prioritizing access to the vaccine for students, allowing them to participate with lowered concerns about infection and to remain in the clinical environment to continue their education. Addressing issues at the federal level to simplify medical reserve corps recruitment, expand the CDC definition of provider to include students, and coordinate with the new administration's task force so they might understand the offer and resource on the table. Next slide. We've learned a lot in this process. Access to PPE and liability concerns were prominent and remain so today. The absence of a national response to the pandemic slowed our ability to bring this initiative online. We believe that the mental health concerns are real and that they should have higher priority moving forward. We also think that valuable experience about student engagement was gained during the H1N1 pandemic that could be applied today. We discovered some bias towards certain providers and their ability to participate in a mass vaccination effort. Public health should be an important part of the curriculum associated with each of the health profession degrees participating in this collaboration. There's opportunity to increase clinical experiences for students in public health education programs. Most importantly, we recognized that the commitment to interprofessional education is real. The 11 organizations involved have been meeting weekly since March to develop the SAA program. And this must continue after the pandemic is resolved. Next slide. So in conclusion, students in the health professions can contribute in expanded ways to the US healthcare system in times of crisis and stability. We just need to open the pathways for that to occur. And we hope SAA can help to accomplish that in some small way as we move forward. Next slide. If you're interested in additional information, please visit the website, aacom.org slash mobilize. And thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Kane. Uh, that was great information. It's a great program. Um, we have a few minutes for questions if you're up for them. But, all right, one of the things that I, that, uh, I noticed in your talk, um, you, you actually began to discuss um, the lack of cross training across different disciplines and uh, especially in the public health realm and the concepts of caring for populations so using student system uh, the students assist america model do you see an opportunity to improve cross training in disciplines especially in public health i do but i think from our experience we're going to have to see a paradigm shift uh, occur to make that happen um, indeed, the idea of um, interprofessional student teams was appealing to the organizations as we have uh, passed through these uh, several months. Um, if I were to lift up the idea of uh, wellness checks among the elderly, well, uh, wellness checks among elderly with chronic diseases, um, if we moved our paradigm towards promoting wellness and not about treating disease, imagine how those teams could function uh, together. And so I'll, I'll, as an example, a medical student, a PA student, a social worker, pharmacist, nurse, 
comprising some type of team overseen by a supervisor from one of those fields working at the top of their degree, um, but able to look across that wellness visit that we're trying to put in place um, for those elderly uh, patients. So again, not focusing on the treatment so much as execution of a treatment plan that's already been laid out by someone else. So trying to move to a greater state of health for our population. Part of the challenge, of course, is finding that right balance between what that delivery team would look like and how it's comprised and how the supervision would be delivered. We know there can be accreditation issues and other things that come into play, but I think it's worth exploring those to try to improve and, and to see if we can actually put those types of teams into play down the road. Absolutely, and that is an exercise that will have an excellent outcome. Uh, you had also talked about leveraging academic health institutions, uh, especially in times of crisis. Uh, I would think similar to flu vaccination efforts uh, in difficult to reach uh, communities. Um, this can be deployed as a rapid response effort, I think, uh, with significant ability to improve outreach. Um, can you expand on this concept? Give us a little bit more information based on your experience. I'd be happy to. Um, I think what we've been trying to talk about is the idea of how do we make institutions of higher education a stronger part of the crisis response um, network. And so um, whether it's a regional disaster or another national pandemic, how can they uh, come into play in a stronger way? And that the students training in those institutions, again, all have knowledge and skill that at the appropriate level can contribute to the response. So trying to think of them as an auxiliary force, if you will, to the main workforce that's going to be focusing on the problem in a more direct way. So how do we back them up? And especially, we think about some of what we've heard today, eight months of this, eight plus months of this, the fatigue that that workforce is actually um, feeling. Think about a map of the United States for a moment. So if I speak first just about the DO schools, 58 campuses, 33 states. There are over 150 MD degree granting schools in the United States and over 250 uh, programs for physician assistant. That's a pretty significant map that we can lay out and think about the circle of influence around each of those programs. But then layer in all of the nursing programs, the veterinary programs, the dental programs, the, the um, uh, social work programs, pharmacy programs, et cetera, that map pretty quickly fills in, even in some of the most remote parts of the United States. But again, think about the circle of influence that's in place. How can we engage that network in a structured way that can more meaningfully respond the next time we need this to occur? And just a quick example, Northwestern Ohio, rural counties, not well served. But a pharmacy school in Northwestern Ohio that's providing flu vaccinations, not only on campus, but at churches, fairs, Walmart parking lots, trying to make sure that people get the care that they actually need. Yeah, I, I think you're tapping into something that has been uh, discussed and bounced around a while, uh, but no action has really happened uh, with that. And I think we have an opportunity now to really consider moving this needle. Um, you also mentioned an enhanced and coordinated infrastructure is needed uh, for the Medical Reserve Corps. Uh, I know we've had discussions about this offline as well. How might this develop uh, to help and, and using the model of Student uh, Assist America, how could all of this be tied together and enhance some of the existing programs that are also at play right now? Well, in complete transparency, prior to the start of Students Assist America, I didn't know the Medical Reserve Corps existed. And, and so it's been an important part of my learning to understand uh, more about the Medical Reserve Corps. But um, the idea, uh, for those who may not be familiar, the idea of the Medical Reserve Corps uh, came into existence after the events of uh, September 11, 2001 and really trying to be able to offer coordinated responses across the United States. Um, it's administered through Health and Human Services. What we've discovered in our um, efforts is that uh, there are probably 50 different versions of what the Medical Reserve Corps looks like, um, and that can be problematic, and that each of those have varying levels of commitment uh, to, um, uh, to delivery. 
So from our standpoint, it feels like reevaluation of that model is appropriate. And then looking for um, ways to better align that model to those institutions of higher education we were already talking about and to the students who are actually available, streamlining the ability to move those students into the system. Now, in fairness to the um, Medical Reserve Corps, it's unclear whether it's you know, the model we've just uh, uh, struggled with or it's the execution of how that model should act in a time of crisis. And so I think that's something that people will be reviewing as we go forward. Uh, yeah, excellent. And I think we have to use all the tools at our disposal and help them align some of the uh, champions that are out there helping us get through this. You know, we have about two minutes left uh, just to kind of frame uh, this next one. Uh, this is actually near and dear to my heart, and I'm going to shift gears just a little bit with you. But what do you think the long term imprinting of the COVID-19 experience with, um, with our current providers, clinicians, uh, but the students that are out there learning in this environment, what is that imprinting going to do and potentially move um, the healthcare system into a new way of thinking about things? What will be the influences of this imprinting? That's a more challenging question. Um, I, I think in some ways it's, it's uh, maybe too early to know uh, uh, what we're going to see and we're going to have to be monitoring and, and watching. Um, practitioners, learners uh, together. Uh, for the students, um, I think uncertainty has been a challenge for them. I mentioned that in my presentation. And so finding ways to you know, move to greater certainty and, and seeing how they uh, respond. But in all honesty, their passion for getting involved with this response, I think says something about the hands will be in uh, and, and not really a shift in pro professionalism. For the frontline practitioners, on the other hand, I think we have to be seriously concerned about burnout and the lingering trauma from, from the experience that they've actually been going through. And that's going to take years to potentially uh, uh, settle, uh, settle through. Um, the um, students themselves, uh, I, I think that uh, there have been some concerns about, did we send a wrong message by pulling them so quickly? Uh, from rotations. Now, some of that was forced by decisions made at hospitals and health systems and so forth, but hopefully we'll be able to get people to realize that the prudence we were really undertaking to not uh, put them in bad conditions, lacking PPE, was not really, a, should not be associated with a fear of what it means to have to care for sick patients under the conditions we've seen with this pandemic. That's great. And uh, we are out of time. I know we can talk about this forever. Uh, this was wonderful and really appreciate your efforts to mobilize a workforce that really is untapped in the United States. Um, Mary Jo, let me hand this back over to you. Thanks so much, Darren. And thank you, Dr. Kane. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with you. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Vineet Aurora, Associate Chief Medical Officer and Assistant Dean for Scholarship and Discovery from the University of Chicago School of Medicine. She's an accomplished researcher, scholar, and practices as a hospitalist. We had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Aurora through the survey and interview process for this workshop, where she shared many of the innovations underway at her institution. Through an interview format, we'll explore lessons learned through COVID and welcome Dr. Aurora. We're delighted to have you today. So let's jump into the first question. Dr. Aurora, you're a recognized Macy faculty scholar. You've studied and researched interprofessional health education topics, and you're considered a bridge leader. Tell us about bridge leadership and why the role of connecting practice environment to education is so critical for the future and in response to COVID currently, as we heard with um, Nancy Spector. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mary Jo and um, the committee for having me here. Um, I did want to mention a little bit about bridging leadership and something that we've written about um, that many organizations and academic health centers have implemented, primarily due to the recognition of the need to align the health professions, education, training mechanisms with um, the actual um, institutional approach to quality, safety, and value. Um, we know that where you train matters. Um, and we also know that um, we've heard 
uh, from really powerful stories from our student panelists and uh, faculty here about these value added roles that students and residents and others can play. And so this bridging leadership idea is really the idea that um, as a leader who um, not only thinks about the health system, but also our medical schools and our health professional training complex, I can help align education and clinical priorities, goals and opportunities. And you might wonder, how does that play into the pandemic? And what I will tell you is a short story of when I knew we had a problem, which is um, um, one of our and this for this uh, talk, I do also want to highlight that learning is extremely large in a pandemic. It's not just the students, it's everybody that's learning. And so uh, one of the people called me in a panic was a senior surgeon who actually is very familiar with donning and doffing PPE. But because of the shortage of PPE and the new types of PPE that our supply chain leaders were bringing forward, as well as the changing um, guidelines that were being put forth by our infection control team and our Hicks Command Center, we had people in our organization that were studying how to put on their PPE and take it off before they walk into the COVID units. And we're were nervous. It was very anxiety provoking. And so if we go on to the next slide, that's when I knew that we had a problem particularly. Um, and what I wanted to highlight is that, um, you know, how do we address these problems? Well, one way to address these problems is to think about people in your organization that are not that are unencumbered by the way things were before. And so when you think about who those people are, um, uh, Cynthia Barton Rabe from this book, The Innovation Killer, we all think about how to be innovative, uh, but we don't think about what kills innovation. There's a lot of things that kill innovation. And one of them is um, surrounding yourself with like-minded people. And so the key to innovation is these zero gravity thinkers. Somebody who's going to say, well, let's just try it some other way. Can we think about it at least? Um, and usually the people that are going to do that are the more junior people on the um, spectrum, our students, our learners. And so that's one of the keys uh, bridging leadership as well, which is be the eyes and ears of those students and residents and health professional workforce uh, trainees on the front line to bring back ideas. And so if we go to the next slide, how does this all relate? And so the current context at COVID-19 at the time was we were starting physical distancing. We were, I was telling you about this vital information like PPE education being, um, you know, um, just message to tons of emails. And I thought it was just my organization. And I read in New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst yesterday that this occurred in many organizations with redeployment, um, thinking about learning and how to teach somebody who's a, you know, uh, um, a, um, a surgeon or a pediatrician, how to take care of an adult medicine patient, you know, how are you going to get all that information? A lot of it was coming through in various ways. And so the mechanism of learning is not just the content, but how it's being delivered. Um, and people expressed a lot of anxiety about that. And this is actually one of our clinicians who I work with, who was staffing our COVID unit the very first day. And so if we go to the next slide, one of the things that I realized very quickly was that PPE education was going to be an issue and it wasn't just going to be an issue for um, students and residents. I mean, we, we like everyone else had to pull our students because of the concerns around PPE and we've rectified those and um, our, have our students back as everyone does. But just to highlight that, you know, when when resources are scarce, you need to innovate. This is actually our uh, what was our first signage that we had um, in our organization around PPE. And that was when the surgeon called me kind of in a panic. Um, so then we innovated with people in the front line and we had observers. Uh, we had medical students that were redeployed as PPE observers to help with this process. And they, and they would actually then ask people about the signage and be like, what can we do to improve your signage? And they would say, well, the signage could be stepwise. We could use a checklist. Um, we could have pictures of people donning and doffing their uh, their uh, PPE. And that way you could go down the checklist and you knew that you were ready. And so um, I know that many people will describe, uh, and I, I myself know this, you need to do a personal timeout for your own PPE. Um, and, know, and that's an important thing, especially as we bring learners back into the workforce. So the next uh, slide, ne next, if you just go to the next uh, uh, picture, 
We also partnered with IDEO, which is a design thinking uh, think tank to kind of innovate in this space and have tested which of these signs actually does better. And what I'll tell you is that all signage is not the same. There are role differences in our organization as to how trustworthiness, uh, the trustworthiness of the sign and how informative the sign is. And so, uh, for example, the nurses really like the middle sign um, and the residents and the physicians really like the IDEO signs. And, um, and there are big differences and gaps between faculty um, comfort and resident comfort. The residents are more comfortable donning and doffing and, than the faculty. And so just to highlight in your organization why bridging leaders is important, but also to think about educating for the entire health system, because it's not just one topic that usually is needed. So if we go to the next slide, when we think about learning in an organization and how we learn, I know that, you know, a lot of us are getting emails and, you know, this constant flurry of emails, um, and that's that has to happen. Uh, but one of the things that people said was they needed this information at the point of care and think about all of the students that were redeployed to do hotlines. We had that too. How are they going to call and patients and with a hotline and call into the hospital um, to help with a consult? How, how is that going to happen? And so uh, one of our zero gravity thinkers in our organization was um, a cardiology fellow who has was also getting a medical informatics training uh, degree. And he had developed an app called Mobile MD to improve communication at the front line. And because we already had a bridging leader role um, to invite trainees to actually present innovations, we knew this existed and we had allowed him to pilot it in a few areas. Um, so when faculty came to the Hicks team and our commander and said, this is too much, we, we can't deal with the emails, we need something better that's at our phone, um, we couldn't deploy IT to do that because IT literally had to socially distance every workroom and create all these um, you know, uh, things in the electronic health record and in the personal health record for COVID testing. And so our Hicks commander said to me, I will allow you to go with this, but do not clog up the IT team. And so I said, well, I have I have somebody who I think can help. And so we took the app, it was already deployed in our organization to a small subset, and we modified it. And so this was sort of salvage and sustain. And so if we go to the next slide, you'll see that we loaded the app with not just uh, the inpatient telemedicine pieces that you would need, but also protocols at the point of care that weren't changing. So working with infection control and infectious disease fellow who was part of our team, we were able to actually go to the next slide, load the PPE instructions into the app and allow people to actually have those uh, instructions at the point of care so that they could refresh themselves with a timeout before going to work or after leaving to say here what here's what the new PP instructions are and so that just highlights a little bit about the role that bridging leaders um, play at a very high level in an organization but also thinking not just about learners but about really everybody so if we go to the next slide thank you Vineet um you're right, you know, your examples tell us so much about the importance of leadership and that alignment between practice and education. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about prior to COVID. Your hospital system had already invested in interprofessional education significantly. For example, using the Ignite model and integrating medical librarians onto IPE teams, which prompted evidence-based inquiry and decision-making. How did you pivot during COVID to salvage these efforts and bring them forward? So I want to say to anybody who's doing any work uh, pre-COVID, uh, it's always a story of salvage and salvage and sustain. And so I will tell you a little bit about the work we're doing and why I'm so excited to be at this workshop, because um, you know I am actually at a um, health uh, uh, an academic health center that does not have a nursing school. We do have a social work school, but we do not have all of the sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, professional training programs, if you will, that would normally go on with a health professional's campus. Uh, we also run at 98% capacity on a regular day. Um, and so we're on the south side of Chicago, which is a, you know, a shortage area and uh, it's definitely a healthcare desert. And so 
On a typical day, we're not able to geolocalize patients into pods where we have students and residents on a service working with a unit of nurses. And so that's been challenging in order to achieve those interprofessional collaborative outcomes um, that we know are, are important. And so that's how we conceived of the IGNITE program. And if we go to the next slide, IGNITE uh, stands for Improving GME Nursing Interprofessional Team Experiences. And the idea was really to marry residency programs with nursing units so that um, people felt this shared um, you know, responsibility to each other and that they were gonna take ownership of the patients in the service line. And so they would be unit-based teams um, composed of resident and nurse champions who would work to identify um, areas that need to be improved on that unit. And they, they champions would actually then engage the rest of the program and the rest of the unit. The cool thing about the program is the nurses nominate the residents, they nominate each other. So it's kind of like an award, congratulations, you're uh, an Ignite champion if you choose to be one. Um, and so far everybody says, yes, sign on the dotted line. I want to you do this in my organization. A lot of that work led to a, a beautiful amount of work around, um, you know, uh, uh, rounding particularly, how to achieve bedside rounding with nurses, how to get multidisciplinary work uh, together. And we actually improved um, length of stay, associated improvements in length of stay. There's always issues around secular trend, but um, at our hospital, we think that's a pretty good thing, um, as well as improved patient experience. And so if we go to the next slide, some of the ways that we did that were to repurpose technology. And this goes back to that zero gravity thinking again. So there was an OB nurse that worked on mother baby who said at a meeting, you know, we have this console in our unit that uh, where they uh, touch the button to say the tray has arrived. Uh, what if the doctors actually touch the button? Because one of the big challenges was when you're not geolocalized, how do you know the physician teams have arrived or the advanced practice providers? So we thought, well, what if we repurpose that console? A surgery resident was sitting in the meeting because we all meet together um, uh, across service lines and said, that's amazing. I want to try that on surgery. And so that hence born these pilots called the MD in the room communication workflow, where when you're rounding, you press the button um, and it, uh, the, it alerts to the nurse phone. We have Cisco nurse phones and it allows uh, nurses and providers to do a touch base, usually at the bedside or in the hallway. So if we go to the next slide, one of the challenges um, with, uh, with this uh, COVID was actually how to sustain that because we saw that we had improvements in outcomes. Uh, residents actually reported greater interprofessional team collaboration and that this was important. And more importantly, from a well being standpoint, that surgery resident documented decreased paging volume. And this is looking at thousands of pages um, where, compared to a control unit, there was a 10% decrease in the unit that they had implemented this on. And across service lines, um, the decreased paging volume went from 15 to 41%. She even went further to show that that was about an hour and a half less of answering pages a day. And so you can imagine, you know, it's what's in it for me, what's in it for education. It's not just uh, patient care, it's improved well being, improved ease of practice. So if you go to the next slide, um, we also show it increased, uh, decreased length of stay and increased bed turnover. And I will say that, in, uh, you know, I was planning on showing this slide. Um, and then obviously in our current bed crunch and bed capacity, you know, where every day is a surge day, you know, we need ways that we communicate to each other to, um, to learn together to discharge patients. So if we go to the next slide. Um, one of the things that we had to do with COVID was reimagine this whole process. And so I will show you data that shows that this process dropped off with, um, with COVID. And this is now what we're sustaining and salvaging. And what we're finding is that what's happening, uh, what we had to do was literally tell people it's okay not to um, you know, go into the room. The last thing a resident or a doctor wanted to do was to be like, well, I'm here with my PPE and I want to, I need to socially distance, but I don't want to bring my nurse into the room now. Um, so what we now have is um, a socially distanced touch base, touch base in the hallway. And this was important, especially with our new interns starting, because we have cycled over new learners. And, um, you know, these learners are never going to meet the nurses without a mask on. You know, how will they know the faces? Um, larger teams aren't rounding anymore. They're doing a lot of web rounding um, and room rounding. And so how, how were people going to literally meet each other to learn from each other, you know, how to take care of patients? And so we relaunched this this past July. This is our project for the year across all units. And so if you go to the next slide, um, 
you'll see that we are currently uh, rolling this out. Um, and we are facing up and down. And so I will tell you that the COVID pandemic, you can clearly see we had, um, you know, we have had a decrease, but then we relaunched. We actually relaunched again um, after um, a little bit of tweaking and signage, and we actually have increased. And so I was recently on service and we actually hit over 130 button pushes. I don't have the most recent data. Unfortunately, the surge hit again. And so now we're back down low. However, we need to emphasize to our staff that this actually is even more important, especially in the bed capacity crunch. And that's what we're doing right now. Uh, we also are measuring things like um, staff, uh, how well do the staff take care of you? And so while I don't have the access there, you can see clearly that um, there are big troughs when uh, the pandemic hits and when surge hits. And so our patients notice these things and that's why we need to think about these areas. And so if we go to the next slide, one of the things I will add about that work is that um, now that our students are back on to the wards and seeing patients, we have actually now also added that value added role of having the students actually connect with the nurse so that that's part of their training. We also, for many years, have had embedded clinical librarians. We've evaluated this, the librarians actually round on the teams, and we have um, two librarians that once a week on different teams were rounding on five different service lines. And it was adapted and implemented in different ways. Um, and so in medicine, they would come on rounds with me. Uh, but in surgery, you know, they, they have to round quickly and get to the OR. And so we didn't want to disrupt that process. So what they do is uh, once a week, they go to the surgery cave, which is the workroom, and they actually ask sort of in a pop-up, you know, uh, library and um, uh, kiosk, are there any questions? And what we see is that there are questions and they're helping with M&Ms. Um, and what happened was we did an evaluation and we showed that adding librarians on the teams did not increase rounding length. That was a big challenge of like, you know, was well, this gonna increase our rounding length? It actually does not, but it improved learning and questions asked. So again, how do you improve the clinical learning environment and partner across with other health professionals to improve that work? Now, when COVID hit, obviously, we're taking our students off. We're definitely taking our librarians off. So we, we had to figure out, well, what are we going to do? And uh, for a while, I was like, I don't know. Uh, but then we redeployed our librarians. And the reason we redeployed them is because our Hicks team was noticing calls to the hotline and not a lot of calls about education, like, you know, literature search. How do you, you know, when we deployed our COVID units, the Clinicians were so busy, how do we actually get information to them? And this was also a value added role for medical students because we actually issued a volunteer call for medical students to help us with this, to use their critical appraisal skills. So you go to the next slide, we deployed the edu COVID educational support team with librarians, uh, myself, an ID fellow, and medical students who pretty much formed the basis of this group to synthesize COVID-19 research for clinicians. Um, and you can see here that that research ranged anywhere from relating to um, specialty like um, OB or pediatrics all the way to diagnosis. And so if we go to the next slide, um, I just wanted to highlight that um, a lot of questions were asked and the feedback was incredibly helpful. And so, um, so we are now repurposing that again in the surge. So if we go to the next slide. So we're coming um, quickly kind of to the end of our, our time together, but I do want to mention that I know when your attending rounds moved to a virtual interaction, you noticed a change in learner satisfaction. And we heard from the students earlier, how, in, a, in just a few minutes, how did you adapt to improve engagement and learning? And what type of investigation and re results did you see? Absolutely, so I'm gonna skip over to, if you can go one slide, um, I will talk about the pediatric experience. And if you can go to the next slide, the reason I'm talking about the pediatric experience is because they already have family-centered rounds. So when we brought our students back, how was the student gonna present to the attending and we had socially distanced limitations? We go, Going through rapid cycle PDSA with our a pediatrician, we actually settled on this speaker, this iPad clip on an IV pole. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we then had to prototype what rounding would look like. And so here you can see the um, uh, parent of a child coming out with a tape that's like, this is your area. Um, a nurse and attending, as well as the medical student is in the maroon scrubs holding the pieces of paper about to present. And so on the, um, the one thing I did wanna highlight is that 
um, the IV pole has the iPad and on that iPad is Zoom with all the other learners. And so when it's called a leapfrog model because one learner will come in and then the attending will go to the next room and then that learner will pull back um, and get on the Zoom while the next learner will come. So it's a way to keep in-person rounding going while this is still going on. And so if we go to the next slide, um, I did want to highlight that this has been evaluated and um, the traditional Zoom rounds was not working at, at all. And so when we went to this hybrid version, we actually were able to improve the quality of our pediatric hospital medicine rotation, which was exciting, but also communication across our areas. And then if we go to the next slide, I just wanted to end with the fact that um, the idea of master adaptive learners and reverse mentoring. And so I think that our students and residents have a lot to offer us. And one of the things that we are known for is out of having multiple hospitals set up COVID units, we are one of very few that had a resident led COVID unit where the residents taught the attendings and uh, modeled team training and workflows. Um, and they were recognized um, for being a uh, Chicago notable healthcare hero. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it back over to you, Mary Jo. Thank you so much, Dr. Aurora. Um, Darren, I'm gonna turn it over to you to, to summarize and a framework is really coming into to view and uh, to hear your thoughts about that. Yes, thank you. Um, and we're going to do our best to keep everybody online and uh, finish up on time. Uh, so I would like to summarize a little bit. Uh, everything that we've heard today We've all been taking notes uh, through our last few months of developing this workshop uh, and through a survey that we're going to be doing in a few minutes, we're identifying a framework. Uh, that framework has really a need for leadership to support innovation. We're discovering academic and practice collaboration is necessary. We really wanna move into investigation, into teaching and learning innovations with attempt, uh, that have been attempted during the pandemic and in some cases are being proven to work well and a systems-based approach to designing interprofessional health professions education, all to prepare the future workforce. Um, you'll be seeing these, uh, the outcomes of this meeting, uh, but before we break, we would like to post uh, some polls. And so if we can put up the first poll, um, we have two of them. They should be very quick to answer. And that should be joining. Yep, here it is. Thank you. We definitely want to hear from all of you to inform our work moving forward. Yes, and how are we doing with, uh, with the results? They're coming in steady. We'll give it just a few more seconds, Darren. Okay. All right, and as we are uh, f uh, finalizing this, um, this survey, we do have one more uh, that uh, Pinar uh, is going to post and here are the results. Uh, Mary Jo, do you wanna run through those? Sure, so it looks like given the innovations presented today, um, you know, and uh, anticipate getting involved with or replicating one or more of uh, these at your institution, we're seeing probably yes, which is great. And definitely yes, um, from 40%. So that that is fantastic. Really? And then we're also looking for this guidance related to should we consider um, continuing this dialogue? And we're seeing a really positive feedback on that, Darren. So That's happy to see that really achieved our goals. Um, uh, Hannah, do we have the, uh, the next uh, survey? All right. This is a survey from Pinar, I believe, mm -hmm. talking about those core competencies that we're seeing that we need to uh, explore more. So very interesting to see more focus on interdisciplinary teams, great, and promoting wellness, really shifting that model um, to healthcare and population health. Telehealth is, is strong as well as evidence-based practice um, and systems thinking, so very good. Well, this is excellent. And uh, it definitely shows that we have motivated people. And I can tell you, we've had over 800 people register for this who will be reading and understanding this information moving forward. 
And I think that, again, might be the scratch on the wall of the beaker to help crystallize a lot of these programs, projects, and interprofessional education. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, we think this was uh, really, really a wonderful afternoon, and we're glad you were able to spend that time with us. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And we'd like to express our gratitude to the National Academies of Medicine and the Global Forum, to Patricia, to Hannah, and for the tireless efforts to our planning com um, committee and all of our presenters. Thank you so much.